On July 16, 1945, the first atomic bomb was detonated in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Dubbed Trinity, it was not long before this weapon was used by the United States against Japan, an exclamation point punctuating the end of the Second World War. America walked away from the war with a sense of supremacy on the world stage. Yet it was not long after the war's end that questions of Soviet nuclear capability were raised. America's fears came to fruition on 29 August 1949, when the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic device. This demonstration poignantly articulated the obverse side of the coin of nuclear arsenals. They could be possessed by enemies as well. Faced with an enemy who possessed an equal capacity for destruction, the United States sought to increase their destructive potential even further. To this end, the first weaponized hydrogen bomb was tested on an Owetok Atoll on Halloween in 1952. The hydrogen bomb differed from a typical nuclear weapon in that it used the fusion of hydrogen isotopes as opposed to nuclear fission alone and was much more powerful. However, it was no less reproducible than its forebears. Case in point, the Soviet Union demonstrated equivalent capability in November 1955, only three years after the Americans, indicating that they were closing the gap between American invention and Soviet imitation. Could they eventually surpass American innovation? Needless to say, the United States government was wary of this prospect. Enter Civil Defense Taking a page from the stalwart British citizens who had survived bombing raids in World War II, Harry S. Truman created the Federal Civil Defense Administration in 1951, anticipating nuclear war. At its outset, this federal administration offered only policy and advisement to states and municipalities. After Soviet thermonuclear capability was demonstrated, however, civil defense was pursued with renewed vigor. The mid-1950s saw a mass dissemination of nuclear awareness literature and film in an attempt to educate the American public both about the providence of nuclear energy and the dangers of its use by enemies. Along with this information campaign, there was a push for patriotic Americans to build shelters to protect from both nuclear blast and fallout. The most far-sighted program of civil defense, however, was the push for urban dispersal. City planners and civil defense officials realized the importance of making cities less attractive targets, and the already established post-war rise of planned suburbs, such as Long Island's Levittown, was indicative of a shift to urban decentralization, which coincided with, and was perhaps spurred even further, by the civil defense agenda. In spite of these campaigns, the calm leadership of Dwight D. Eisenhower throughout most of the 1950s kept the situation with the Soviet Union from degenerating into crisis. However, under his successor, John F. Kennedy, Soviet-American relations came to just such a crisis point. Coming to office during tension over the status of post-war Berlin, Kennedy exacerbated the situation by increasing military spending and calling for a massive fallout shelter program. This perceived preparation for war emboldened the Soviet Union to build missile silos in Cuba, leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. For many, the crisis showed just how futile nuclear war preparations were. After coming to the brink of war, there was a strong feeling that disarmament was the only solution. This along with the mitigated fallout risk achieved by the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963, led to a decline in the prominence of civil defense in American life from the early 1960s onward. But, in its heyday, from the first Soviet test in 1949 until its decline due to its perceived futility in 1962, how viable was the American civil defense program? In regards to radiation awareness, were the documents and films spread to the public sound sources of information? Were safe dose levels actually so? Were radiation hazards downplayed or sensationalized? Were doctors and emergency workers prepared to deal with radiation casualties? And what of the fallout shelter program? Would shelter owners be given enough notice to retreat to shelters in time? How long must shelter survivors wait before emerging in the aftermath of a blast? What of shelter ethics? Was it moral to defend one's shelter against unprotected neighbors or bar those who could not reach shelter in time? Not least of all, were proposed designs for shelters adequate defense against the blast? The fallout? Anything at all? Urban dispersal, too, must be viewed as one of the tenets of civil defense. To what extent was urban dispersal a viable defense and deterrent against attack? What dispersion distances were required to mitigate blast damage, and were they feasible? Was dispersal a natural process, a government initiative, or perhaps both? These questions all share a common thread. To what extent was the American public informed or misinformed? Was quantifiable knowledge disseminated, and if so, were the numbers reliable? Did civil defense lead to blithe acceptance of inevitable nuclear war and thus put more lives in danger through expectant readiness and even anticipation of war? Ultimately, from 1949 until 1962, 
was the American Civil Defense Program a benevolent use of scientific knowledge for the purpose of preserving American lives? My research has shown that government agencies peddled literature which offered false peace of mind by maintaining radiation was a minor hazard. Your hair would come back. Conversely, Hollywood preferred to play upon people's fears and lack of knowledge about radiation's actual effects. <coughs> Nonetheless, sound, quantifiable knowledge existed and reached the public in certain measures. Even the unsound knowledge, too, can be said to have served a valuable purpose where it promoted awareness and got people thinking about forces which threatened their existence. As for the fallout shelter craze, research done since the period has shown that personal shelters were insufficient not only to survive a nuclear blast, but even to protect against fallout, should the owners even make it to the shelter on time. Indeed, many scientific writers agreed that the only adequate shelters would be underground tunnels lived in on a constant basis. While some took this as an indication that peace was the only answer, there were advocates who proposed plans for the mass migration of industry and society into the subterranean world in earnest. Monsieur! Finally, urban dispersal, the one tenet of American civil defense which predated civil defense itself. While one can certainly find fault with the overly contrived ribbon city or donut city designs which would minimize the city's attractiveness as a target, or even the arbitrary assertion that 100,000 is the ideal population for a city, big enough to function and small enough not to be targeted, the logic behind dispersal is quite sound. Even the most powerful nuclear weapons have limits. Yet while civil defense and urban dispersal did have a relationship, my research thus far has shown it was not a causal one. While radiation awareness, fallout shelters, and urban dispersal were not all equally useful means of protecting the American population, cumulatively, and in spite of their faults, ethical problems, and difficulties in implementing, they were better than nothing. Short of peace treaties and test bans, American civil defense was a step, albeit an inadequate one, in the right direction.